right, here are our instructions for today. So we are delighted to have all three of you here. Thank you very much. We're going to draw straws to see who starts for the first question. Each candidate will give one minute to introduce themselves as we draw the straw before we ask the first question. One minute. <laughs> Brief bio. And then candidates will take successive turns being first to answer the questions. The winner of the draw goes first. Each candidate will be given a limit of one and a half minutes to answer the same question. And warning will be given at 30 seconds. And Lisa, you're going to give the warning. You have it. Mm -hmm. At 30 seconds. 30 seconds and, and then stop. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There will be not be any rebuttals. Close to the okay. end, candidates will be given the opportunity okay. to share closing remarks. There is a limit of two minutes on those closing remarks. No questions from the audience will be allowed. The audience may speak one-on-one -on -one to the candidates after the forum. Well, we can't cause any trouble. You are not going to draw straws. Okay. That's why we go together. We call a little trouble like that. <laughs> <laughs> So it appears that Jan Sessler will go first. Are you ready for your first question? Oh, I am sorry. <laughs> Would you like to meet me? <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Is that good? Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for being here. I actually wrote a really amazing speech, probably one of the best ones I've ever done. And I did it about a half hour ago because I decided I wasn't going to do it today. Um, I know that most of you know me. You can look at my website. You can learn about me. Um, I'm endorsed by President Trump, and I don't think I'm probably going to win any votes by, from any of you today if that doesn't win you over. Respectfully, I, I say that. And, and so what I want to I want to say something that I think is much more important for our country right now, and that is, how many of you know the names Jim Copenhaver, Jake Dutch, or Corey Kimkorator? Yeah, a couple of you do, especially Corey. Corey was killed uh, by a bullet that's bound for President Trump on Saturday. And those other two gentlemen are in the hospital fighting for their lives. There's two things that we need to understand there. And this is not going into the zone of conspiracy theory, but the Secret Service knew that President Trump was in danger and they did not get him off the stage. We don't need to talk about anything else. That is the end of the story and it's quite frustrating. Um, number two, just real quick, 10 seconds. The rhetoric from the left has incited this for years. They are complicit. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> That's, this one really works, doesn't it? I'm Dan Newhouse. I'm your representative in Congress. Thank you very much for putting me there. I'm very proud and honored to have this position, and I want to continue working for you. Let me tell you why I first ran for office. You know what? I'm a farmer in Sunnyside. Lived in, I was born here, lived here my whole life, and every single day, it seemed, I would wake up and there's some new rule, some new regulation, some silly law that was making me a criminal. And so I decided that somebody needed to change that. And that motivates me today to stand up for not only the agricultural industry that I'm a part of, but the rural way of life in the United States of America. That's something that's lacking in US Congress. I'm one of about a dozen and a half farmers or ranchers. And I think our, our voice, our rural voice needs to be heard. That's why I'm chairman of the Congressional Western Caucus, a group of over 100 members of Congress from all over the United States so that we can stand up for rural issues in this country. I'm proud to be here. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Ms. Yes, thank you. I was born and raised on a small farm in the 4th Congressional D District, picking cherries to raise money for my basketball shoes and sports camps. I love this district. This is where me and Scotty chose to move back after his military service to raise our three boys. I have taken on the government for 20 years. Um, when Scotty was blinded in Iraq by a suicide car bomb, I took a one-way flight from right here in the 4th District to Washington, D.C., and, and it was the first time I was exposed to government bureaucracy and how it affects our everyday lives. 
We are at a point in this country where this district deserves a voice who can stand up and take the values of the 4th Congressional District and work with President Trump and my friend, J.D. Vance, to get these policies across the line. I will fight to protect and secure our border it, and, and find permanent protections for it. No more using it for political slogans or, or smear campaigns. We've got to protect our border. Our children's lives are at stake and get our economy back on track, fight for our children. So that's why I'm in this race. Thank you very much. All right, and thank you, Candace. And if it's all right with you, I'd like to address you by first name. It's just gonna be easier as I call on you. Thank you for that, allowing me that. So the first question goes to Jared. Do you believe illegal aliens should receive any form of financial or social welfare support from taxpayers, including legal support such as social security card or driver's license? Why or why not? Absolutely not. Those, those are tax dollars. They're a tremendous drain on the country and the economy. Uh, it's absolutely terrible. And as somebody that's endorsed by President Trump, uh, we certainly would not support that. Uh, we need to deport the invaders and uh, we need to, you know, stop these, this free, free ride that's happening. Uh, what, what the illegitimate Biden administration is attempting to do is the same thing that, that Obama did with DACA, uh, where essentially the Supreme Court made DACA legal because you, you couldn't take away citizenship once you gave it. And that's exactly what the, this illegitimate administration is doing. And we have to stand, stand against that kind of lunacy in this country. If you think you would like me to repeat the question, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Dan, do you believe illegal aliens should receive any form of financial or social welfare support from taxpayers, including legal support such as Social Security card or driver's license? Why or why not? So, Madam Mayor, this is one of the biggest reasons that there is a literally a blinking neon sign at our southern border that says open. We're at, at attracting people to this country for the, just exactly what you're talking about. They're getting all of these benefits that people that have come legally through our country aren't even eligible to get. So the, the answer is no, we have to stop uh, attracting people here. We have to put policies in place that were there uh, in the last administration under President Trump. We have to gain control of our border. We have to finish the wall. I've been to the southern border in Arizona and Texas and California and have seen the, the wall sitting there waiting to be put up and erected. Our tax dollars are rusting in this Arizona sun as we speak. We have to stop that. We have to gain control of our, our, our sovereignty and our, protect our nation. So the long answer, short answer, absolutely not. Thank you. Tiffany, would you like me to repeat the question? That's okay. Um, this is exactly why the American people are frustrated with this country. Um, unfortunately, um, Dan voted for amnesty in 2021 for over a million illegals. That, that gave the green light um, to come into our country illegally um, and there would be no ramifications. So that's exactly what people are tired of. We need to protect Social Security um, for those who have earned it and paid into it. We need to protect the American people. I look forward to getting into Congress, the largest freshman class that we have had in 100 years, and getting to work with them to solve, there, there's ways we can solve this problem, making sure the American people are protected. Um, I've been to the southern border as well. We, we need to work with President Trump. This district deserves someone who can work with President Trump, who will work with President Trump. Um, to finish the border wall, we know it works. Jared, I know you think the border wall is antiquated, um, but it is not. Um, it actually works and it will stop the invasion that's happening at our southern border. Um, not only that, we need to make sure that our border patrol has everything that they need, resources to protect us and stop the flow of fentanyl that we know is coming into our country. So there's, there's so much at stake right now in our country. That's why it matters who you vote for in this district to have a voice in this next administration. Um, we also need to make sure that, um, I know I've talked to sheriffs, I'm endorsed by many sheriffs around this district, and fentanyl is coming into our district, it's here, it's killing our kids at much younger ages. So, um, yeah, again, this is exactly what the American people are tired of. We've got to stop it. We've got to stop the invasion that's happening at our southern border. Thank you. All right, uh, Dan, you're going to start no, question no. two. Okay. Right. The question is, do you believe in birthright citizenship? Do you believe in birthright citizenship? Why or why not? So I love our Constitution. I, I love the founding fathers spent 
months, years putting together the things that, that we depend on to continue and allow our de democratic republic to thrive. However, there are some changes that we should make, and this is one of them. Let me just clarify something. I've never voted for amnesty. I would not vote for amnesty, just so you know that. That's not true. And to clarify something else, I have a, a strong record of working with President Trump. Four years of working with President Trump, and I'm looking forward to another four years of his administration. Yes. So I'm going to ask you please to refrain and be respectful and listen to everything our speakers have to say. So that, that wasn't meant to be funny. This is very serious. We have a lot of challenges facing our country. Just about a month ago, President Trump came to visit the Republicans in Washington, D.C. Our entire conference was there. You know what he spoke about? He spoke about the future, about unity, about working together. I took that literally, and I'm, I know personally many people that were in his administration. They're friends of mine. They're going to be involved in the next administration, and I'm the one. Of all the people standing up here, as, as humbly as I can say, who is best positioned to work in a new Trump administration. Thank you. Tiffany, would you like me to repeat the question? Do you believe in birthright citizenship? Why or why not? Yeah, I think at this point we need to put a pause on everything and uh, make sure that we're protecting the American people first. And now we have strong legal Im immigration that's permanent, that we don't use it as uh, political jargon for re-election every cycle. Um, so I look forward to working with the Trump administration. And in fact, Trump is um, not going to work with you, Dan, and you know that. Um, that's why he came in early, because he wants anyone but Dan um, and endorsed Jared. So I stepped in this race to fight, to go forward and give this district true representation. And I agree, um, we need to make sure, we need to look at our um, immigration laws and we need to make them permanent and make sure that we're protecting the American people first. Thank you. Joe, would you like me to repeat the question? No, it's okay. Let me just clarify some things. Um, first of all, most people don't like conflict, and so that's why a lot of people get a little uptight with these types of conversations. It doesn't bother me. Um, Tiffany has lied about me on TV, and she just lied about me again uh, in regards to the border wall. Of course I support the border wall. Can you imagine President Trump endorsing someone that didn't support a strong border? Uh, in fact, on November 2nd, Tiffany said that she does not support the border wall on King 5 News interview. So you can look that up, that's a fact. And in uh, Congressman Newhouse, uh, you did vote for the uh, Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which was H.R. 1603 in the, in the 117th Congress, which did give amnesty to illegals. And, and that's the point. We, we have to secure this border. The American people do not feel safe. We need President Trump back in office. President Trump did pick me Tiffany got in the race because Dan needed somebody to split the vote because he was absolutely dying the week before the filing. That's why she's here. That's why she's here to help him. She's here to help herself pay off her debt from her Senate race, which is exactly what she's doing. She defrauded donors over the last couple of years with her Endeavor PAC. God bless her, but she's compromised financially, and so is Dan, and that's why they're here. Well, that's news to me. They need to answer your question. Yes, Thank you. So we're going to ask you to direct your responses to the question, if you would be kind enough yes. to do that. So thank you. Um, so Dan, I'm sorry, Tiffany, you get the third question. The cost and availability of labor is an increasing problem for farmers in the Yakima Valley. The ever-increasing regulations that accompany the H-2A program are making it almost impossible for smaller farmers to utilize the program and stay in business. How would you modify the H-2A program to help ensure an adequate labor supply and manageable program guidelines? Yes, well, farmers, you know, don't work nine to five Monday through Friday. Um, so a lot of these regulations don't fit our ag industry. In fact, I was just with a large um, far farming operation and they're having to get creative and jump through hoops and find ways to make it work for them. Um, our government is making it harder and harder for them to utilize H-2A. And they're good workers, and the workers want to work. They're begging to work overtime. They're asking, can we work overtime? But farmers cannot keep up with the wage increase and then the overtime pay. So we need to make sure that we keep a robust um, amount of workers in this district for our ag industry, but then that we can also work hand in glove 
um, with the Trump administration as well to decrease some of these regulations and that, that become so burdensome for our farmers. Um, and, and they've made that clear as I've talked with them across the district. Um, and make sure that we you know, have robust debate, bring it to the table that we protect our dams. Because if we lose our dams, these workers don't have jobs. And that's problematic, not just, we will lose billions of dollars in this district, not just for our farmers, but also for our workers. Thank you. I, uh, Jared, would you like me to repeat the question? No. All right. So the big problem here, and, and this is one of those questions where I doubt any of us up here are probably gonna disagree, we're all very familiar with the farm industry. The challenge is, as I see it, one of the, in specific to the H-2A program, and there are, there are definitely some, some specific things that we need to change uh, in regards to that, but the, one of the big and most harmful things that our farmers have to deal with is that there are not just the H-2A, which is a federal program, which has its own set of, of circumstances and criteria that, that the farmers have to abide by, but then you also stack on top of that the state regulations that are coupled together. And, and one of the biggest things that I would push for is to separate those and actually give the farmers a choice. You either follow the federal program, which is X, or you follow the state program, which is Y, and you give the farmers a choice and you create competition between those so that the farmers are, are able to actually survive. And let me explain that a little bit further. Uh, the, the issue with the farmers, when you grow something, you don't have the ability of going out and changing the price on it because your fertilizer and your fuel and your insurance costs go up. You can't do that as a farmer. You don't get paid maybe for a year or a year and a half later for those goods and it's set based on commodity market. So farmers are in a much more difficult situation financially and I think everybody needs to understand that. Thank you. Dan, would you like to repeat the question? Why don't you? Yes. The cost and availability of labor is an increasing problem for farmers in the Yakima Valley. The ever-increasing regulations that accompany the H-2A program are making it almost impossible for smaller farmers to utilize the program and stay in business. How would you modify the H-2A program to help ensure an adequate labor supply and manageable program guidelines? Thank you, Ms. Madam Mayor. As I said, I'm a farmer in the Yakima Valley. And you know what one of my biggest priorities in Congress is? the ag labor rules and laws that we have to abide by. I, do you know when the last time major immigration reform was passed by the House of Representatives? Before the last couple of years, it was 1986. Until my legislation, which has been referred to, the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, has passed before the House twice, which reforms the H-2A program, allowing farmers to have a legal certain supply of workers for our important agricultural industry. It needs fixing. It's too slow, it's too expensive. It doesn't work for small farmers. We have to have changes. If you talk to any farm in central Washington or throughout the country that has similar crops that we do, their number one issue, water probably, labor. It's gonna be right at the top. This is something that I actually wrote this bill that I've been criticized for. It does not provide amnesty. It, it gives people who have been working here for a long period of time an opportunity to get right with the law, not citizenship, but to be here legally. We need these people, and we need to provide them a legal way to come into our country, work, and then a legal way to go back home, knowing that they'll be able to return without having to pay a coyote five or 8,000 bucks and put their lives in, in danger to come home. So, yes. All right, we're moving on to the next question, and Dan, you are receiving this question first. Do you think that an employer's religious belief should impact the health care their employees receive? Why or why not? I, I don't think that the religious belief of anybody should be impacted. In our country, we have a separation of church and state. We have the constitutional right to worship as we would like, as we see fit and benefits that I get, that you get, Tiffany and Jared get, should not be impacted. Um, I protect the right, the constitutional right for people to, to have to experience and practice religious freedom in our country. This is what our country was founded on. This is what one of those things that we have, 
have to go to the line for to protect our constitutional rights. This is just one of them, but there are many, like the Second Amendment. My gosh, the other side wants to take away our right to defend ourselves. Now they're gonna put restrictions on our ability to get medical care because of our religious beliefs. How ridiculous can this get? Thank you. Tiffany, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure, thank you. Do you think that an employer's religious belief should impact the health care that their employees receive, why or why not? No, absolutely. I mean, I think we would all agree on the state on that question. And, and you know, uh, religious freedom, our constitution was, was based on um, inalienable rights. And um, that's what we need to stand on in this country, separation of church and state. And making sure also, I think, you know, what we saw in COVID was sort of an infringement. You, you don't call it religion, but, um, it was an infringement of our rights. So we need to make sure that, um, you know, we are coming from a base of um, our constitution and what our founding fathers really wanted for our country, the freedom of speech, um, second amendment rights, uh, and stand firm on those in this country. Um, absolutely not, they should not be able to impose their religious ideas or beliefs on um, their healthcare issues. Thank you. Jerry, you have an opportunity to answer the question. Yeah, companies should not be forced and employees should not be forced. It's just totally unconstitutional. Um, I wanna say that uh, there, there's this interesting situation with this whole idea of the separation of church and state uh, because that is a fabricated uh, circumstance that doesn't actually exist. We are a representative government. Our First Amendment is very clear about our religious rights and freedoms. So if we are a representative government and we have representatives running our government, how can we separate that from the government? It's not possible. And so, you know, our, and again, it's in the First Amendment, our, our religious rights. And, uh, you know, people need to be able to, to uh, worship as they please. And uh, I, I think that's very important. And we need to get past this, you know, this idea that, you know, somehow people go into government and they don't have any personal beliefs. They, they have personal beliefs and we ought to be considering those when we're voting. We wanna, we wanna vote for people who can actually uphold the constitution when they take that oath. Do you think that Elon Omar can actually uphold the constitution? She cannot. She's a devout Muslim. Muslims cannot uphold the constitution. It goes against their religious beliefs. Now, good for her for getting there, but shame on her voters for putting her there if they actually believe in America. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to the next question, and, and Tiffany, you're going to go first. Healthcare prices have risen drastically in recent years over already massive cost inflation over the past half century. Medical special interests like Big Pharma are some of the top spending political players in most states and nationally. Why should Congress, what should Congress do to control healthcare costs? Stop getting money from Big Pharma. Um, you know, I was working as a nurse when Obamacare came down and it became very clear um, that we were supposed to see more patients with less time. Our pay got cut, they hired more coders, they hired more people in the back rooms, pushing paper um, and charging because they needed to make more money. That's not a good, from a healthcare stance, that's, that's not going to create good patient outcomes. It's going to cause uh, prices to skyrocket, hospitals, overhead to go up. Um, and I saw that firsthand. So we need to make sure that there is transparency and accountability. That's something I will fight for in Congress as your next Congresswoman. Um, that the insurance companies have transparency and accountability. And that when you go into a hospital, you know what the price is and you know what you're getting billed for. That's extremely important. You know, I mean, today everything is high. And um, so in addition, I'll add on to that, we have to get inflation down. Um, we need Donald Trump in office. I look forward to working with him and J.D. Vance to get this economy back on track. So prices can go down for hardworking families, which in turn will help decrease some of the uh, cost in healthcare. But it is absolutely something as Republicans that we need to come together and solve and fix and give a plan to the American people that works. Thank you. Jerry, would you like me to repeat the question? No, it's fine. I actually uh, wrote a plan for healthcare that you can see on my website. It's actually quite detailed and it breaks it down into the categories of federal, state, and personal. 
And uh, what we need to do in order to bring the cost down is a number of things, but one is we need to get the federal government out of it, just like a lot of things. We need to decentralize the authority the federal government has. It has become this gargantuan beast, much through things like the 16th and 17th Amendment, which are absolutely terrible and should be abolished. Uh, but the federal needs to focus on education. And the state needs to take responsibility for actually what plans are offered. And we also need to make sure that providers can operate across state lines so that we have our capitalist system operated to keep the prices down. Now let me just, because we're into this, it, there's also a personal aspect of this. I was diagnosed with terminal cancer 25 years ago. And one of the things I did was I didn't do conventional medical treatment because they said I had a 5% chance of living. I changed my diet and I, I lost 70 pounds and I got really healthy. And uh, I have eaten healthy ever since. You might have heard the ad that, that Tiffany and her team, she might not know about it because it's her consultants doing everything for her, but she's hitting me because of my diet. That's the only thing they can come up with. And so I just want to invite you, Tiffany, and everybody here to the pizza at Wildfire Pizza tonight at four o'clock. My favorite pizza is brisket and sauerkraut. And uh, let me just add this. President Trump endorsed me early sorry, because he knew I could beat Dan Newhouse. He is up. not happy sure. about Tiffany Smiley getting in the race at all. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, would you like me to repeat the question? Well, I think it has to do with health care and costs. Yes, so, so. <laughs> Just guessing. But, um, so this is one, maybe this is one of the things that we can find some agreement on but the, between the three of us up here. I truly believe transparency is a huge part of this. Where else are you going to go buy something that you have no idea what it's going to cost you, other than a hospital or a doctor's office? You're not going to go buy a car and just let them charge you whatever they want. You'll find out in a couple weeks. <laughs> That's not so. We need to have transparency in the system. I think competition works really well. I mean, that's what our economic system is based on. Absolutely. You know, things like like Jared brought up, uh, allowing insurance companies that, to work across state lines. Competition. It works. You know, that, that's the way. Again, how our system was built. So, what I'm most concerned with. It's rural areas. You know how, well, I don't have to tell you how difficult it is if you live in a rural area to access adequate medical care. You know, th things like telehealth are really important, absolutely. We've got, to, we've got to do all we can to encourage uh, medical professionals to locate in rural areas. I'll get it if you don't. And, <laughs> which is why I'm so happy that we have a medical school in Yakima that encourages people to locate here and, and spend their professional careers in our rural areas. So, so we have a lot to do there. It's been one of those things though, that has been very elusive, unfortunately. We have Obamacare, we're all enjoying that. Yeah, now you can laugh, but it's costing us a lot. I've had, I've had Canadians tell me, oh, I'm sorry, red flag, do not let what happened in Canada happen in the United States. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> um, we are on to our next question. And uh, Jared, you actually have this question first. Yes. Many people mistrust the security of our elections. Without infringing each state's right to implement their own voting processes, what steps will you take as a congressman or congresswoman to improve the integrity of our election system? Yeah, that's a good question. We do need to bring integrity back, especially in this state. And I'll tell you that uh, I'm, I'm not, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm not really wildly confident about most of the statewide races for us this year because of all the corruption that happens in Washington state. But I'll tell you one race we can win, and it's this one, because this is the most conservative district in Washington, and it's the most conservative district on the West Coast. And we need to take this district and put a ultra conservative, passionate, hardworking, man who's been in business for over 30 years, who's led hundreds of companies, hundreds of locations, and thousands of employees. And I, I can tell you without articulating it here now, but I have a plan for how we can take Washington State back. And it's not actually all that difficult, but what it involves is us here in Eastern Washington stopping at complaining 
about Western Washington and starting to go on offense against Western Washington, and I have a plan to do that. We need to have in-person voting, same-day voting, make it a holiday if you need to, check IDs, vote by precinct, get together in your garage or a local school or whatever it is, count the votes together that night, let's do it, it's very easy, and I can't imagine why we've allowed all these computer systems in foreign countries and all these other things into our system, not to mention the crazy, corrupted voter rolls here in Washington State. So. That's what we need to do, and I'll help us get there. Thank you. Dan, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure, for the audience, it's for the Thank audience you. benefit. Many people <coughs> mistrust the security of our elections. Without infringing each state's right to implement their own voting processes, what steps will you take as a congressman or congresswoman to improve the integrity of our election system? So thank you. House Republicans in Washington, D.C. have actually passed very, very important legislation in order to restore the confidence and integrity of our election system in this country. You know, one of the one of the things that we cannot get the other side to agree to, proving who you are when you go to vote. In a lot of states, you can just walk up, vote. We've got, you know, so many people, you, you, can't, you can't buy beer in the grocery store. I, even I get card after me. Um, you used to not be able to, to rent a movie without providing ID. People have the ability to prove who they are, and we've got, we've got to put that requirement on something as sacred as voting. Without that, there can't be integrity in the system. You can't have a, a motor voter law that it signs people up automatically. We have to have integrity, and that, that means proving who you are at the time of voting. Uh, we've got some work to do on this, and this is one of the things that I think is the most crucial thing in our country as it relates to elections. If we don't have faith in our system, what have we got? What have we got? And so taking some of these simple steps are absolutely necessary. Thank you. Tiffany, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, no, I'm good. Um, you know, this is, as um, I have traveled all over this country and this state, this is an issue. Voters do not believe that their votes count or that they matter. They know, they feel like we have a government, we have career politicians who do not deliver results for them, so why vote? And we saw in COVID states just change laws like this without the voters voting on it. And they've gone back and, and like in Pennsylvania um, and brought it back to the voters and, and changed some of their laws, but people were watching that. Um, and we have to believe in our vote, uh, that your vote it counts and that it matters. And we need to give people a reason to vote in this country. Um, and I, I believe Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, they need a strong Congress to fight with them to restore hope and a vision in this country that we are not the United States of America if our people are not voting. So federally, I know that we should make it federally that you have to have ID and be a legal citizen in this country to vote. Um, that's something I will fight for. Um, I will roll up my sleeves. I know President Trump is passionate about it, but I do love what President Trump is doing. And he's saying, swamp the vote. <laughs> Go vote. Tell your friends. Get your ballots in early. Um, and it's time to get this country back on track. There's just too much at stake. I will fight in Congress to make sure that we have, that you have to show your ID and that you're a legal citizen to vote in this country. Thank you. I'm gonna ask whoever's phone that is that you would please make sure it is turned off. If you have a phone in your pocket, on the table, or in your purse that has the ringer on, please take the next 10 seconds to make sure that it is on. Because that would respect for the process here. Thank you. Are we ready to move on to the next question? The first is to you, Tiffany. According to the Cato Institute, government expense expenditures on K-12 education have more than doubled over the last 40 years, adjusted for inflation. And yet, U.S. students' academic performance at the end of high school is flat. What steps will you take to improve the quality of education in our public schools and provide other options for all students? Yes, this is a, a reason why I'm passionate about getting into this race to fight for my children and your children for generations to come. I'm a mom of three young boys and I saw firsthand what happened in COVID. It's shameful, it should never happen in this country again. No plan um, to make up the learning loss. 
um, no plan for competitive education. At the federal level, what I am excited to, and I know J.D. Vance is a fan of this as well because of where he came from, um, we need to make sure that there is some sort of voucher program that follows our children, that the money follows the child um, with no strings attached, that parents have a choice where they can send their kids, that your zip code does not determine your destiny in this country. We need to make sure that we're teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic and history, that our children are educated, that they understand the Constitution. Um, these are values that are so sacred to our country and will change our country. We're, we're living in it now. Um, so we need to make sure that parents are in control, that parents have rights, and that they are involved in their children's education. Um, there, there's just too much at stake for our children right now. I also am very passionate about making sure that our children are exposed to trades at a much younger age in this country because there are multiple pathways to the American dream. College isn't always the answer, and I think we've seen that played out in our country over the last year or so. Um, trades, we, we need workers, we need uh, plumbers, we need uh, construction workers, we need electricians, um, and we need to make sure those apprenticeship programs are full in this country. Thank you. Jerry, same question to you. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, it's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we, we have three kids that are grown. Uh, we homeschooled them all the way through from the ground up. Uh, we, we just didn't want the environment or the quality of education that the, the Department of Education offered. And, and we just wanted that time with our kids. We felt like it was very important while our kids were young uh, that we were there with them. And uh, that's also a reason why I didn't run for, for office uh, many years ago was because I wanted to make sure my kids had their daddy with them and, uh, while they were growing up. Uh, a good friend of mine, Thomas Massey from Kentucky, introduced a bill the last two Congresses to, to abolish the Department of Education, which is something that we need to do. That's a $72 billion a year budget on the national level. And what do they do for us that our local school board members can't do? They can do everything and we can put that responsibility in their, uh, in their court and with this dual federalist system that we have, and as beautiful as it is, we can hold them accountable because those school board members are elected, and that is amazing. And as Tiffany said, we do need to have backpack funding. We need to allow those tax dollars to follow our kids, whether it's your kids or grandkids, uh, you need to be able to make sure they get the education that they deserve and that they want, and I will just add to that, we have got to make sure our kids are safe. Thank you. Dan, would you like the question repeated? No, I'm good, thank you very much. One of the things that we've done in the House, and unfortunately the Senate is controlled by the Democrats, so some of these things are waiting for action in the Senate, is pass something called the Parents' Bill of Rights. The most influential, important aspect of a child's life should be the parents. And that's the, one of the things that we learned in COVID during that crisis that I hope we never have to repeat, is that parents were looking over the, their students' shoulders on their computers and seeing what their curriculum in, included, what some of the things that they were learning. And so that tr uh, offered tremendous uh, uh, transparency to our educational system. And parents woke up to the fact that, wow, this is not going the direction we need to go. So I, I agree with my opponents on some of these things, absolutely. We have to have options for parents to choose from, whether it's charter schools, whether it's homeschooling, and bless Jared for doing that. These are the things that have to have to be available, and the money has to be there for them in order to be able to make it successful. So I'm, I'm all for the accountability and the results, and I'll take it even a step further. In higher education, there has to be accountability there. Student loans are just going through the roof. Unpaid student loans, Joe Biden has a plan for that, that doesn't work, by the way. However, schools have to have a responsibility there too. If the return on the investment for the sky high loans that those students are taking out is not there, there should be some accountability to the schools too. Thank you. Excuse me, I think, um, Tiffany, you've had an opportunity to answer the same question, okay. Then we're moving on, uh, and Jerry, you will answer this question first. The Biden EPA is demanding that states shut down reliable, low-cost energy despite the outages that have already been caused. What is your plan to provide citizens with the reliable, locally controlled, and low-cost energy necessary for, uh, to, to fuel economic growth and widespread prosperity? Let me just uh, quote my mentor, drill, baby, drill. We have to get the energy production going in this country again. We need to start drilling. We need to get the Keystone Pipeline going. We need to get the Atlantic Coast Pipeline that was shut down by this 
uh, Joe Obama administration, that's a gas, natural gas pipeline. We need to stand against this absolute utter lunacy that somehow put natural gas in the crosshairs. Even coal power is good for us in America and in the world. The problems that we had with coal in the past we're getting it out of the ground in a, in a safe manner, which we've solved, and cleaning the exhaust where it's burned, which we've also solved. This area is, has an abundance of, uh, of incredibly inexpensive energy uh, through the dams and nuclear energy, which we champion here, which I hope we get to talk about the dams more. Uh, but if you go back to the 40s, there was a gentleman named Leland Oles, who was the energy director, and he was ousted by Lyndon Baines Johnson because he knew that inexpensive energy led to human flourishing. And we need to remember that in America and throughout the world because uh, we cannot survive without inexpensive energy. And if there's one thing that has driven our economy in the wrong direction over the last few years, it's the cost of energy. Thank you. Dan, would you like me to read the question? For the audience benefit, I think so. Okay, thank you. The Biden EPA is demanding that states shut down reliable, low-cost energy despite the outages that have already been caused. What is your plan to, to provide citizens with reliable, locally controlled, and low-cost energy necessary to fuel economic growth and widespread prosperity? So you all know that before Joe Biden took office, we were energy dominant. We exported energy. Now we're energy relying on foreign sources that a lot of times are not our friends, our allies. We have the solution to our energy needs literally right under our feet. I'm an all of the above, you know what that means, energy kind of guy. We need them all. I've got nothing against wind and solar in the right places, but we need natural gas, we need fossil fuels, we need all of those things. We need nuclear. And I'm glad Jared brought up the dams. We need hydropower. Did you know that in the next decade, we're anticipated to grow in this state of Washington, unless Jay Inslee chases everybody away. We're, in, we're supposed to grow by a million people. Already, just last winter, we were within 20 minutes of a brownout because of, of our ability to produce enough energy when it's cold. And the heat of the day is the same, same story. We need more sources of energy. We need them all. We can do it responsibly. Our, our carbon footprint, even though we're not part of the Paris Accords under President Trump, we were the only country to reduce the, our carbon footprint. You know why? Because we utilize natural gas. And now the state of Washington, in its infinite wisdom, wants to ban natural gas in our state. So just put a plug in for the initiatives. Vote yes to pay less in November. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, um, same question to you, Tiffany. Yes, um, you know, this is such... <laughs> I, I was just in Okanagan um, County talking with those residents and the EPA is destroying our small communities, um, forcing out their logging. And, and we know that loggers manage the forest best and cut down on forest fires. When you think of the pollution that goes on with our forest fires every year, in regard to the dams, that is where we have the safest, most reliable um, energy right here in our fourth congressional district. And we've never been at a more scary place of having them breached. So I just want to say, you know, if Dan has been our protection on the dams, we need a new protector. Um, I, I've been to many of the Columbia Snake uh, River Irrigators Association. I'm endorsed by many on that board. They understand that it will take executive level, the executive branch, to work with us here in Washington State, hand in glove. I look forward to working with President Trump to unleash American energy independence. We should be leading for the country from this district. Small nuclear reactors are the way of the future. They're safe, they're reliable, um, and they're powerful. China, Russia should be buying energy from us, and we should be leading from right here in Washington State. I know the executive branch will work with, hand in hand with me to make sure that we deliver for you guys in this, in this district. Thank you. All right, we're going on to another question, and uh, Jared, you are going to, oh, excuse me, Dan, sorry. You are going to receive the question first. Do you support federal funding for long-term shelters, job training, and trauma-informed services for victims of human trafficking? Why or why not? I've never had that question, but this is a huge issue, and it points to the seriousness, the crisis that we have on our southern border. Human tra trafficking, don't think it's just something that happens in Seattle or in Los Angeles. 
It happens here in Yakima. It happens in the Tri Cities. It happens in our communities. Whatever we can do to stop this terrible, terrible practice, we have to. If it means uh, giving assistance and help to those, usually young ladies that are that are being uh, uh, victims of this of this crime, then I think we should do what we can to help them. Absolutely. But, but the crux of the issue is that to stop the criminal activity to begin with. There can be no, should be no tolerance for this kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to victim or, or say that everybody coming across the southern border are, are future criminal, criminals. They're not. But the fact of the matter is, when you have zero control over what's happening on the, on the border, you don't know. I don't know if you or you or you, if you have nefarious ideas or you have good intentions when you come into our country. So it comes back to enforcing the laws we have, having control over who comes to our country and, and enforcing the laws in our cities and towns against human trafficking. This is, this is a scourge on our society. It's something that we have to stop. And, and I, so I, my reaction is if those victims need help, we should step up to help. Thank you. Tiffany, same question to you. Yes, as a woman, we should absolutely step up and help those victims. And it's a problem here in this country. You know how we solve it? Secure our border now and stop the flow of criminals coming in and human trafficking women, children. Um, when I was down at the southern border, I met with a farmer and he took me over. He said, here's the rape tree. This is where they bring women, young kids, rape them, and then take them to safe houses all over this country, right here in Yakima. Our sheriffs need to know that they are supported, that they are funded, that they have every resource that they need to, to track these criminals down and protect and secure women and children in this country. I mean, but we, we have to do it by securing the border first. We know that the border wall will work. I look forward to working with Donald Trump to build the wall, to stop the invasion that's, that's happening and stop these crimes from happening. Thank you. Jared, question to you. Yeah, thank you. I'm not going to expand the question, but I do agree we need to secure the border. Uh, I totally disagree with them. I am not a big government guy, as obviously they are. And Dan Newhouse has proven that by his time in office because, uh, and I've asked you this before, Dan, but I don't think there's ever been a spending bill that crossed his desk that he did not sign. And of course he would sign for this. This is not a federal issue. This is a state issue. Yes, it's the federal government's responsibility. Read the Declaration of Independence read the constitution read the 10th amendment this is a state issue but there is no question about this this is the reason their answers are the reason why we're in the financial problem we are right now because the answer is always yes to spending and it's not right if we don't curtail the spending on a federal level we are never going to get our economy under control we are spending a billion dollars a trillion dollars every hundred days more than we have that means we're getting the credit card out and swiping it for a trillion dollars every single hundred days. Now, it doesn't mean that I support this trafficking. Of course not, it is absolutely wrong. But we are not big brother, we are not God. The federal government is supposed to be limited. The most power is supposed to be held in the states. That is the way our system is designed. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at my list of questions. I apologize. But, uh, actually, the juries are starting. So, uh, okay. Do you believe states should have sanctuary status? Why or why not? That question is ambiguous. I think what you mean to say is should states be allowed to create sanctuary status for people who are not a part of that state? Would that be a better way of saying it? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, no. I mean, again, look at look up the definition of dual federalism. Okay, we are we I'm fall. Ask you to hold okay, we fall. It's just I don't want to blow you guys out. We fall underneath the authority of the federal government, and we fall underneath the authority of the state government. And uh, we 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 can't circumvent them. The the states are supposed to be supposed to have the most authority, and. Uh, and so that, yeah, we, we can't allow the states to circumvent that. But, but again, it, to me, the problem is in that particular case, it goes back to the 16th Amendment. 
The 16th Amendment is where the, the federal government was allowed to start taxing us directly out of our paychecks. It was never supposed to work that way. The money was supposed to flow through the states and the states would pay to fund the federal government whose primary responsibility was to keep us safe. And so to think in that way, it's like, okay, the states can kind of do whatever they want, but not if they're funded by the federal government. It's the, so the whole thing is sort of backwards and messed up. And so I, I would just ask for us to sort of zoom out on that and think bigger because that's not the answer. But I will note, I will note this. I am endorsed by the House Freedom Caucus, which makes up about 10% of Congress. And those members, some people say, I'll answer it more later. Thank you. Again, same question to you. So wouldn't it be nice if we could pick and choose which laws we want to follow, right? And that's exactly what's happening in the sanctuary city, sanctuary state uh, situations that we see across the country. And that, you guess what? That's coming back to bite some of those jurisdictions, right? Thanks to the governor Abbott of Texas and other individuals that are letting them share in the wealth with the crisis that they're experiencing, experiencing on the southern border. So. Patricia, the answer has got to be no. You cannot have certain parts of the country, certain states, certain jurisdictions that decide, eh, we're not going to follow that law because we think we know better. There's a system in place to change laws. You know, there's a lot of things I don't like about the law. That doesn't mean I, I, I don't follow it. All of us are that way. But we, we have a system in place to change it. And that's what we should be following. That's what makes our country great. That's what separates us from many other countries around the world. And so, sanctuary cities, no, no way. Thank you. Tiffany, same question. Yeah, uh, sanctuary cities, no way. I mean, we're seeing the destruction of it right before our eyes in our country, from New York to here in Washington State. I mean, we cannot house and take care of criminals. I mean, it, it's we're not protecting the American people. You know, I've talked to ICE agents who have said like, we, our hands are tied and that has to stop. We need to make sure that ICE agents have everything that they need to protect the American people. I know that will happen under Donald Trump's administration. I look forward to working with him on that as well. Thank you. All right, we are down to our last two questions. Dan, you have this one first. What is your strategy to get our hostages back from Hamas? support Israel. Israel is our biggest friend in the Middle East. Unequivocally, Israel has to be supported by the American uh, country. Uh, they, they are, <laughs> there we go. So the, the long and short of it is that our friend in the Middle East who is one of our few friends we need to support 100%. Benjamin Netanyahu is coming to Washington, D.C. next week. He's going to be addressing a joint session of Congress, and I intend to be there, to listen to the, the, the leader of Israel tell us what they need, how that we can be more impactful to help them fight off this terrorist organization. Um, so we have, you know, we, it isn't by bringing in uh, assistance and aid to the enemy like this administration wants to do. It's by making sure that our friends have the resources that they need to stand up to somebody that wants to eliminate them from the map. And I think that's, that's the long and short of it. Without our support, they are at risk of disappearing and we cannot allow that to happen. Thank and, you. and by the way, if that does happen, don't think that we're going to be any safer for it because because all of those countries that want to do us harm, they will be emboldened if that if Israel falls. Thank you. Tiffany, same question to you. Yeah, how we get a bag to elect Donald Trump and let Mike Pompeo get in there um, and do the work that we know he can do and get our hostages back. Um, they've done it before and they'll do it again. I'm fighting every day to make sure that we get Donald Trump elected. Unfortunately, not everyone can say that, but that's okay. Um, that's why I'm here and that's why I'm fighting for the fourth congressional district. Um, under President Trump, we had the most substantive peace that we've had in the Middle East in decades. The Abraham Accords created peace that this shouldn't have even ever happened. Um, and it wouldn't have if Donald Trump would still be in office, but here we are. So there is hope on the horizon, but I believe that's how we get our hostages back. We need the 18 back in the White House. 
and we need to make sure that they are fully funded um, and that they have every resource. You know, instead of spending money on a dock that sinks in Gaza, let's support let's support Israel and give them everything they need. Thank you, Jerry. Again, peace through strength. It's Donald Trump, elect Donald Trump. Uh, I prefer General Flynn for the Secretary of State. I think he would be a warrior. If you guys haven't seen FlynnMovie.com, I encourage you to, to watch that. I'm the only veteran in this race, and uh, I also want to point out and, and call to attention to Warrant Officer Brandon Budge, who is a Black Hawk pilot who has flown. Brandon, if you could raise your hand, he's standing by the door over there. He is a Black Hawk pilot. And what happened during COVID is his life was ruined. 20 years, he was 19 plus years in the army and he refused the, the COVID vaccine while his wife was pregnant. They would not allow him to come home uh, to be able to see the birth without taking it. So he took the risk and took that vaccine and he still got docked to Warren Officer 3 instead of Warren Officer 4 where he's supposed to be. He talked to all three of us up here on the stage over the last few years and I'm the only one that did anything to help. Dan Newhouse refused to sign a letter for him, refused to call members of the army, leaders of the army to stand up for our military. I'm a veteran, I will fight for our military, I will not give up, I will not relent, and that's part of the reason why President Trump has endorsed me and Michael Flynn has endorsed me. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? I have one last question. It'll be short. Okay, Nathan, one minute. One minute long, all right. And uh, Tiffany, you get the first shot at this one. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm glad you're smiling. What song makes you sing along whenever you hear it? Kenny Rogers, you gotta know when to hold them. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jared, question to you. Oh my gosh, do we? Uh, so many come to mind. Uh, I guess for some reason, Eye of the Tiger by Survivor. I'm an 80s guy. 80s music rocks the house. There is no other music than 80s music. Thank you. Dan? So this is going to sound like I'm probably just playing to the crowd, but I just I just can't. Every time I hear uh, the national anthem, you know, whether it's at a baseball game or somewhere in the Capitol or at an event, uh, so... I don't know how many of you watched parts of the convention last night. Oh my gosh, the stories that were told there and, and the songs that were sung that just, I hate to admit this, my wife teases me about this all the time, brought tears to my eyes. Thank you. I wanna thank each of you personally for coming today, for sharing your hearts and your thoughts with us. Uh, well done. And uh, we are gonna ask if you can stay for a while and meet with people individually and, I'm sorry, we probably will. Would you like to close? Okay. Yes, I'm saying that. Yes, I'm asking you. You can go ahead and start, Jerry. No, I had to open. All right. <laughs> yeah, would you start the closure, please? How much time do we have to close? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> ten minutes. I get your time and Tiffany's time. Awesome. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Well. Thank you very much for your attention today, taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. I think, I think this is an important part of our democratic system. Like I said before, I am proud to be your representative in Washington, DC. I've got the experience, and I, to speak as humbly as I possibly can, I've got the position, the seniority, the relationships. You know, politics is a people business, it really is. And I know, a, I know a lot of the players in Washington, D.C., and I'm particularly looking forward to the next Trump administration because you know what? Key individuals that were part of his team are personal friends. And I think that's gonna make me very, very impactful and effective in, in dealing with them and solving some of the problems and the challenges that we have. My, my focus, my priority has been agriculture. Shoot me for that. I'm a farmer, so that's kind of what I see the world. But this, that's an important part of our district, absolutely. I am a champion for the Snake River Dams. In fact, I just had a meeting last night, a public hearing, a meeting, not a hearing, at WSU Tri-Cities. A hundred people came out to express their fervent opinions about how much we need those dams and how much we would suffer without them. I've said this before and I'll say it again, those dams won't come out while I'm in Congress, over my dead body. That, that's something that's a huge priority of mine. I'm on the Appropriations Committee, which is important in order to get spending down in this country, which you have to do. 
I'm in a good position to, to do that. I'm on the select committee on China to make sure that we are aware of every, every threat that the Communist Chinese Party is, is presenting to us, and that includes buying our valuable farmland in this country, which is happening at a rate that's 10 times larger than it was a decade ago. So many things that we have to solve in this country. I'm just honored to be your member of Congress, and I look forward to continue working as hard as I possibly can on your behalf in a new Trump administration. Thank you. Yes, as I've traveled all over this district and talked to big businesses and small businesses, nurses, teachers, doctors, parents, it's clear. They are very worried about our district and our ability to um, have our priorities heard. And not only that, but have results. You know, um, if, if I've been in office for 10 years, when I'm your next Congresswoman, if by chance, I don't wanna stay in there that long, but if I've been in office for 10 years and all I can come back and say is what I'm going to do, tell me to get out. Because you deserve to have a voice who will work with President Trump and J.D. Vance to make sure that we secure our border, that we get our economy on track, that we unleash American energy and independence, and we make sure that our children have competitive quality education. I'm the only person in this race that can win. I am the only person that will work hand in glove with President Trump. I, I also have a commitment to you that I will run a full race every two years. It's shameful the voting turnout in this district. We need to get that up. We need to give people a reason to vote. We need to show the country who we are in this fourth congressional district. We have an opportunity to lead on our economy, our agriculture, and our energy for this country. And I can't wait to go back and tell Donald Trump how amazing we are here. We know that other people on this panel cannot work with Donald Trump. And it puts our district at risk. In fact, you know, our founding fathers never intended Congress to be a place to just sit and get rich. Yesterday, I signed the term limits pledge, and I have sheets here for, for Dan and Jared, if you guys would like to sign it as well. I think this is important for our country that we have tried and true people from the outside who aren't career politicians to go in, get the work done, and come back to their district. Thank you, Tiffany. Jared. Sign this. Whoops. Sign the term limits pledge, Tiffany. I'm not doing this to be something. I'm doing this to do something. And Dan, I'm glad you brought up the uh, the dams because you and I were on the stage on January 4th and January 24th, your team came out with the Dam Act, which was basically my answer in that debate, which I thought that was kind of interesting. Things can happen fast in DC if you give them some good ideas. Uh, but I didn't give you all the ideas. There's a, I only gave you one of eight points in that. So my dam act will actually be better, and I've got the relationships in Congress to be able to get co-sponsors to be able to make that thing happen. Uh, I want to I say a, a, just an incredible heartfelt thanks to my team. Uh, we've got over 1,400 volunteers across eight counties helping us. We have over 7,000 signs up. We're knocking thousands of doors every single week. If you'd like to get involved, we'd sure love to have you. Uh, I can tell you that I will not relent. Uh, I, I was a hard worker before, but having the weight and the honor of having President Trump's endorsement, I'm sleeping three or four hours a night. Last night it was less because one of our calves is sick and we're trying to save her life. And so I was up working on that, but um, it would be an utter disservice to the American people if you did not elect Jared Sessler for this seat. Uh, reminder tonight, Wildfire Pizza will be there at four o'clock. Love to have you, and we'll leave you with this. Don't be cynical about America. Be cynical about public leaders that refuse to do the job we elect them to. If you want to take part in the American dream, then you need to understand that it is an equation that involves opportunity and an abundance of hard work. Without those two together, you will never experience the American dream. Not because you can't be rich in some other way, uh, but because inheriting success will never feel as great as the success that you worked for. I'm Jared Sessler. Thank you for being here. God bless you. It's an incredible honor to be here, and I look forward to being your next congressman.
Yaşıyor. Yaşıyor. 